Okay. So amazing. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Gigs Community Call, where we will be talking about the amazing platform Afropedia. Uh, and we have with us today as a speaker, uh, Emilio Velez from El Salvador. Uh, Emilio is the general direction director of uh, Afropedia. And uh, he's also a proud gig member. We're proud to have you here. So maybe we are the proud uh, to have Emilio as a gig member. Um, so welcome, Emilio. Um, I want to say that Emilio joined us two years ago, and ever since, uh, we have been so happy to meet on different occasions, whether you and Republica or now online digital, sharing your knowledge and also your work uh, in the open source world and the world of open sharing uh, in the past years. So I feel that uh, at this moment, um, I would also hand it over, but I want to say that this call specifically uh, was a request by um, our newly joined uh, Ukrainian makers um, uh, as part of the Tolokar project, uh, one of our projects that we have also introduced in the past calls. So we're very happy to start this also as its own series in a way, in a way to mentor and to share knowledge with our fellow Ukrainian makers who are in a part of the world that could make use of that knowledge. Um, so yeah, thank you, Emilio, for taking the time to be here today. And I think I will hand over to you so that you could uh, yeah, introduce yourself more, maybe start first by giving us a, a, a background and information on, on your journey, your work journey, but also how you winded up uh, doing what you do at Afropedia. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I will begin by making a small correction that I I joined gig one year ago, but it feels like it's been ages. Oh, <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> and I feel such a, yeah, like uh, I love this community and uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to say that. Um, um, yeah, an introduction about myself. Uh, I am based in San Salvador and I am... Um, I've done work, uh, I'm an engineer, I'm an industrial engineer, but I worked for many years in international development. And then as a side gig, I started doing all these different projects of open hardware or with Creative Commons licenses. And, you know, so I, I started building up um, some, yeah, experience that then I, I put together uh, when I started working on Operapedia. Like I, I really found a place where I could uh, still, you know, just uh, follow the values of development, of justice in general, and then do stuff with technology. And yeah, and what I do on Apropedia is try to work with a community of people who are fostering knowledge. Yeah, like the, the access to knowledge for appropriate technologies, and poverty alleviation so that uh, yeah that is part of what my work entails um let me share my screen all right so so last time i i was part of a a call for the critical making program i don't know if you saw it i hope you did um so if you missed it it's fine but you can go and check the recording. We spoke, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you like a, a few, um, a few things as a recap. First is that we explored the importance of documentation for critical making. So discussing a little bit about why having documentation is important, why, um, why open source in general, creates this space for collaboration. And the idea is to connect, not only to have a one way uh, 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 via, via communication, but rather to have a conversation with people through documentation. So the people who are creating a project are speaking to an audience and they are trying to express more than just a list of materials, how to assemble them, they're, they're telling a story. Um, and I spoke a little bit about how that works and how we can create spaces where we hear from the people who are creating the things, um, uh, enabling the participation. And then participation means 
that both sides are uh, having to listen and to be changed by this experience. So, so yeah, we spoke a little about that. And then this time we'll talk about Apropedia. So I want to share a little bit about Apropedia as a platform um, so you get to know what's in it. And I want to give you a first tour on how to create a documentation page, like a very, very simple starting point, but it will give you like a small taste of how we work on Apropedia, but most importantly, how Apropedia tries to um, use documentation and you know the the like the the impact that we want to create through making good documentation so um first what is apropedia apropedia is a wiki so a wiki is a site that anyone can edit so you can go here on apropedia and see a bunch of technologies that we've uh, put here on the front page but we have hundreds and hundreds of pages, um, about 12,000 in total. And we have different different types of things. Some are projects. Uh, some of them are, for example, recaps of um, research that uh, the academic community has done. It could be, for example, students of a class who are designing something, then they can put it on Apropedia. Or it can be a nonprofit who's working on the field and they want to, to share so that it's the knowledge is not lost. Um, and uh, that the, the, the goal of this is that any new knowledge that's being created does not end on a bookshelf or a drawer only to be graded or to be evaluated. Uh, but rather to be used as a source of knowledge to reproduce and to reduce the cost, to stop reinventing the wheel um, in, in terms of what are the solutions that we're creating. So we aim to be an infrastructure for open development. So uh, the main goal of the Apropedia Foundation is to maintain the Apropedia site and our vision is to build rich, sustainable lives. Um, what kinds of things you can find on Apropedia? All sorts of things, like, uh, as I mentioned, project documentation. So people were in a time and place, they did something, and we tell little about it. Um, appropriate technology designs and ideas. Um, it can be guidelines, it can be technical briefs. So all sorts of work that has already been paid for. Um, it's research is usually not um, considered as academic because it comes from the development uh, industry or area of, of work, but we are trying to make it um, in a way that's reproducible that other people can find it. They can cite Apropedia for the research and that happens a lot. People go on Google Scholar, they're looking for very specific agricultural practices. And what they find is someone on Apropedia who uh, put their work and then they can cite it. Uh, and that also means that work done by communities or um, traditional knowledge can be used for uh, as a source of knowledge that can be cited in academic work or in other types of research. Then uh, some part of our community works with sustainability news. Um, we have open educational resources. So some people throw in guides uh, and lately we've been working with uh, people who are developing surgical training materials that uh, have, for example, simulators that can be built with uh, a 3D printer or by assembling a list of materials and then uh, other content that you can review to learn a specific skill. So uh, that's something that uh, we're heavily working with right now. And then all sorts of media resources related to climate change or to working communities. Uh, and then finally, the things that organizations like nonprofits 
are working on and they um, they're putting on Apropedia for everyone to to find. And over the course of a year, we usually have around a million and a half page views. Uh, and that means 72,000 visitors every month with 12,000 pages, 3,000 authors, and which is past the mark of 2,000 projects. And you can see that despite there being, you know, a good uh, uh, group of people from all over the world, we're still trying to uh, work on finding uh, the knowledge from different countries, especially from academia. There's lots of work in lots of our countries that students create either devices or either research on all sorts of different things that are trying to solve problems in our own communities, but it's not being documented anywhere. So this is one of the examples of where we want to tackle um, bringing our work as Apropedia. And some of the uh, documentation, you know, the, the impact of documentation that we want to bring into our practice uh, can be explained in three main examples. This one is uh, a patch of, of grass or of soil in California that students of this high school dub the triangle of death because everything that's being planted there dies because there's always lots of traffic of students. And you can see here, these are three projects from different years. Um, some of them are from you know, 2009, 2015, uh, 2021. And you can see the story of students trying out different things and you can learn from what worked and what didn't work, which is something that usually you don't see on other spaces because we try to focus on the things that did work. So we have all this survival bias where we don't know what has been tried before and didn't work. And that is one of the big problems that uh, we can see in international development. But um, by having documentation that tells more of a story, we can learn about what are the intentions uh, and what are the things that ended up working out? Like in this case, putting in these uh, big pots in these spaces, which was the final solution that, uh, you know, now students can go through and things will survive. Uh, and then we also see lots of building upon uh, projects. So the, the one on the left was um, started during the, the beginning of the COVID pandemic for a master's project, which is uh, a fan, uh, an electric fan turned into a filter, air filter for COVID. And the year afterwards, a group of students who are undergrads took the same design and repurposed it for the California forest fires. So you can see that it is very similar the same build of a project, similar list of materials, but then uh, an incremental innovation that was to make it solar. Um, and I, I was a, a mentor for this project and the solution that, that the students devised was to add a timer for the, the solar panel uh, to have enough energy to last the night. So in the end, um, this solution was very uh, efficient and more efficient in terms of energy than the previous one, uh, despite the students being younger or less ex experienced. But um, the fact that there was already documentation that was complete helped them build this. And then on the right, we have a business model that was designed based on the previous um, solution, right? So we had economic students working on this to build upon the work that's already there. Uh, and this is this is something that we're trying to um, nurture a community of people who are not only building the, the devices, but also thinking of how to make uh, 
these models sustainable or to make iterations around different business models. And then the third one is about structured information. When you enter Apropedia, uh, any project page, you will see that we have a list of metadata that's built on some of the work um, that was done by the Internet of Production Alliance. And um, for some, for those of you who know about uh, or you've heard about it, uh, where you see the Open Know How standard, or a very, very uh, specific standard for Apropedia that builds upon the Open Know How standard and that can speak to it. And we can take the structured data to every page. Uh, and I can show you really quickly one example. So here we have a, a list of all the metadata, uh, which is what you can see here, which is structured. And then we can use for external applications. So in this case, we recently built uh, a tool to extract from the documentation page and then uh, help people certify um, using the Oshawa certification API. So that way you can build from the documentation all sorts of different things. This is only one example, but you can do things like uh, maybe machine learning uh, applications or uh, making search engines. Um, yeah, so who makes all of this? I think uh, we have uh, a list of groups um, that is comprised by Apropedians, the uh, people who believe in, a, uh, in the community of Apropedia and come in regularly, edit pages, add their own projects. Um, we also have people from academia. So it can be people who are post uh, graduate students, but also undergrads who are doing very basic assignments. We also have high school students sometimes who come in and they do things like mapping their uh, community resources, for example, based on the SDGs or all sorts of different um, areas. Um, so there's contributions to be made at all different levels. And then members of organizations like nonprofits um, and these could be, for example, the UNDP. Um, we're working right now with the Accelerator Lab in El Salvador, and they're doing mapping of appropriate technology um, in different parts of the country. They're mapping organizations. They are mapping technologies to filter water and all sorts of different things or projects for energy and using also Apropedia as a source of knowledge or just for inspiration to think about what kinds of projects they can build in the new community. And then finally, innovators and makers, uh, which really uh, goes into the heart of uh, this space with gig. Um, you know, people who are wanting to share um, their innovations or their projects. In some cases, um, one of the differences that Apropedia may have with other platforms is that we really aspire to have a space for not only breakthrough innovations, but also to tell stories about what is happening in communities and to, to bring in this component of the community work. So uh, Apropedia is definitely a space for that, about workshops that you've done as part of your um, project development for hardware, or it could be evaluations of projects and all sorts of different things. Um, that it's not only about the hardware. Uh, you, you can even have a project living on a different platform, but if you want to document the, the, the work of design or the work of uh, community um, that goes alongside it, you're more than welcome to use Apropedia for that as well. And then why using Apropedia? Why, why should you use Apropedia? So first, we want the knowledge to live on, and we want all sorts of uh, knowledge that is part of the innovation process to live uh, here. Uh, we are following open documentation standards, so it's very easy to move from one platform to another. Um, you can download your, um, your pages and your content and take whenever you want. Um, and we're very focused on the purpose of innovation. So lots of critical making 
um, that goes alongside the work of Afropedia. And then just to end, before we move to the next part of the um, session is talking a little bit about so some of the policies and guidelines. So first, trying to seek to share knowledge that fits into our vision. So um, we want to think of innovations as more than just making devices or just uh, you know building things, but rather thinking about all the different components that go around it. We welcome original content. And this is why we're not Wikipedia. So Apropedia was born at a time where people wanted to share some of these solutions, but uh, different from an encyclopedia, you can have 10 different designs that are very similar. Um, and they might be there might be subtleties that are important when you're um, doing all uh, sorts of work that can create impact. So Apropedia was born as part of the need of building the space to share um, with a focus on the context. And then we um, are trying to implement not only um, licenses for documentation, but also for hardware and for software. So um, Apropedia is a good space for documentation of hardware in general. Uh, and as you saw before, we're trying to uh, create new integrations and to make all of our documentation machine readable. So we're trying to prepare for what's coming next. And now let's move to the demonstration. So I, I am going to share this so you can follow, uh, but I have page right here. Um, let's see, I'm gonna close this. So I have four very specific things that we will try to do today. And this, because this is going to be um, available later, you can go at your own pace and try it out. So the first one is um, an easy one, which is to create an account. So you just go to uh, this page right here and you fill out your information and you can um, create the account. So you can choose a username, um, then a password, confirm it, and you're free to, uh, for example, add your email address if you want to have, um, you know, just uh, receive notifications or to make it easier to recover your password, et cetera. But it's not mandatory. Um, and yeah, you just fill out this, you create your account, you just click on create account and you have an account ready to go. So this is the first one, uh, let's see. And then we go to the second one, which is editing your user page. Um, so first uh, notice that all the user pages live on what we call the user namespace and um, these are all the pages that start with user and then the columns uh, sign and then followed by the account's username. So if, for example, you create an account here, um, here, and then, and we just go with a password. Let's see if it goes without any checks. So there you go. So you have a new account here, and this is your user page. And if you go here to the link, you see that it begins by saying user, then call a new gig user. And this is your account that's ready to, um, to edit other pages, but you can begin by editing your user page. And the idea of editing your user page is that people can see who you are. If you add your um, your real name, you can um, be attributed for your work. And that's something that uh, we encourage, but it's definitely optional. Um, so yeah, you can go to the page. One way of doing this is just go to appropriate.org, like a different way of doing it. And then you just type it in. 
and it's the same page here. And you can click on create this page or you can use the little pencil sign here, uh, the icon, and then you just uh, start editing, right? So um, you save the page. You can put a summary, especially with pages that um, are being worked by different people, like there's collaboration going on. It's really useful to add a summary. And I will show you one example. Uh, let's see. So you click here and there it is. So if you see, for example, this is my user page on Upperpedia and you see that it's completely blank because I deleted it previous to this. So what do I do now? Um, so if you click on more, there is a bunch of different options like deleting the page, um, moving. So moving means renaming it. So it goes to a different page title. Uh, you can protect it. Uh, this is, uh, or you can watch it. So when you watch, you receive an email or a notification when other people make edits. So if you click on view history, you can see that there's all sorts of different uh, edits and there's a version control. So you can go back in time to see the different edits that other people have done. So it says who made the edit. Some of these are made by Safi Burris, which is the uh, lead developer on Operapedia. So he edits my user page sometimes. Uh, and I, you know, so, so I can see what has been changed. I can see, for example, the difference between one version and another. And you can see here um, a difference because I deleted it. And this is all the content that was before. And I can undo my changes. And if I undo my changes, then uh, it brings back all the content. And then it creates a summary for me saying, I'm undoing this revision. And I say, yes, I, I wanna do that. I want my user page back. And once it's done, then you will see that my user page is back. So this is very useful for every single page. You can do the same thing. Um, so yeah, let's move on. Um, so yeah, so now let's go back to the to the page of the new gig user. Let's see. And we're going to add a link for global innovation gatherings. So you see, I already created a page for gig. Um, so I click on create this page and I will add a link. And then I can say global innovation gathering, which is a page that is on Upperpedia. And then it tells me that it already exists. So I select it. And okay, so this is one way of editing the pages. And um, there is another, which is using the wiki text. So wiki text is a type of markup that all wikis like Wikipedia already have. And the way that you can um, access it is by clicking on the edit source um, button. So if you do this, you will see that it has a markup that shows a link to a different page. And you can switch from the source editing view to the visual editor just by clicking here. And this is useful, especially when you have more complex content. And, um, it gives you very powerful capabilities for editing pages and doing all sorts of things. All right, so um, yeah, so I can, for example, copy this wiki text and either add it here on the source editor or on the visual editor. So I, I can paste the wiki text and it creates the already formatted text that can be easily read. And then we just save the changes and it's already live.
And I know that this is very simple, but I want to walk you through some of these actions. So now we can talk about uh, playing in the sandbox, which is basically using um, a space that is under your user page. So you can play with, add images. Um, so the way that you do this is by creating what we call a sub page. So, so what we're creating here is a link um, to this, the same page, which is here. But now we will edit it. And instead of that, we will go to what we call the sandbox. So this is a, uh, a standard that MediaWiki uses. Let's see here. For uh, types of pages that people can just come in and edit without any uh, fear of messing anything up. So you can use this, this page here um, to play out, try it. For example, some people like me, uh, I, I edit my pages on the sandbox. So you see here, it's the same user page and then slash. So it's like into a folder, it's a sub page. So you can do all sorts of things here and add images, for example. Uh, yeah, so you can add different images like this image and then you insert it. And yeah, you can go back, make all sorts of changes. And that's a space that's safe for anyone you can make your drafts there and then move them, move the wiki text to a different page. Right, and then finally, let's talk a little bit about how to start a project. Um, here, um, I already created, so if you go to this link, I already created um, a, a prompt for you to start making a page that is not from scratch. Um, so one way, before going to that, I'll, I'll do it the, the most simple way, which is I, I'm thinking of a new project. Uh, so it's going to be called New Game Project. And I create a link. Um, and this is what sometimes it's useful to do, just find it, creating a link on your user page or somewhere else, and then you click on it. So if you see, it's a red link. So a red link means, that it shows you that it doesn't exist. So you click on it and it tells you, all right, you have to create the page. So you can do that, or you can use Apropedia's capabilities. Um, so what we do is that we usually can create for you a, uh, a preloaded template. So, so you just add in the name of a page that doesn't exist. And then when you create it, it gives you, you know, a complete uh, template for you with already a notice saying, hey, this is part of gig or maybe part of a project by an organization. Um, if, for example, you're enabling other people to document, we can create some of these preloaded uh, materials and you can come in, um, and think of a structure. We create the structure with, uh, for example, maybe a YouTube video with annotations. Um, there's all sorts of diff different things that you can do on Operpedia. And then you just give it to someone and then they can just you know, start editing. Like, all right, I need to write a brief description. And then they just start typing, which is a way to not feel like you're starting from scratch and also you can see that there's, there are a few templates, uh, the metadata templates that I mentioned before that already have, for example, I added that this is part of critical making program um, as an example. And I added innovation as a keyword. So this can help you uh, when you're helping other people document uh, to have pages with the right categories, to not worry about all the nitty gritty details and you just get down to writing. Uh, adding images um, and editing. Yeah, so that is what I have. I didn't want to go like 
to into you know documentation that's good that could be like a you know speed running session of a few hours of yeah let's just sit down and uh but yeah i wanted to give you like a brief overview of what we do um so what i would recommend when creating these pages is doing something like um for example structure uh let's say So you, you can create a heading here and then you can say, okay, what do I need? I need a bill of materials. I'm going to need a assembly. Let's see, I'm gonna make it larger. And I'm gonna add tools maybe. And yeah, other resources or maybe uh, operations manual. All right, so this is the kind of thing that we need. Um, so you can create sub pages for that, similar to what we did with the sandbox. Um, so I I take this and I'm going to create a link to the gig project slash bill of materials. And there it is. Um, I'm going to create a link to the gig page slash tools. And the same for the others. So what you do with this, and the reason why you're doing we're doing it in in this way is useful. Then we save the page. Um, is that now you have a list of all the things that you need to follow in order to finish, and that can help you once you have a structure of documentation this can help you tackle all the solutions uh, saying, okay, I, we have to subdivide the work or upload these images, et cetera. So you have all these pages that are already set up um, to edit. Um, and I can, I can give you one example of how this is useful. Let me see. All right, so I'm going to show you one page um, that was used for my Republica workshop um, last year. And I have all sorts of different sub pages here. And I created what we have, we, we call a navigation menu here. And then I we can add a template that helps you do the navigation and go to previous, next. So when someone's reading your materials, you can help them navigate more easily, right? So that this is useful for people who are uh, creating extensive pages of content. If you only have one, uh, that's a common thing as well, but you can do uh, all sorts of different things on Opera PDF. And then you can, for example, download everything as a PDF file uh, and then make it ready for print. This is something that we're uh, slowly developing, but we want to be good at it because we know that some of the work that you do uh, is done in rural communities or in places where there's no internet access. So it's important to create content thinking of what are the possibilities of uh, giving this to someone making printable versions, maybe booklets. So have some sort of uh, guerrilla, you know, uh, way of just bringing in the knowledge to people, um, regardless of the access to internet. So yeah, with this, I, I end up and I'm open for questions or comments. Thank you so much, Emilio. Amazing. Like one comment that comes into my head, how come that wasn't the case since always, you know, like just seeing how you went through the structure and the, and the process, the thought process, and it just feels very intuitive and feels very um, simple, I want to say. Uh, so it's so great to know that this tool is actually um, available at the moment. And yeah, this, thanks I, so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, I, I mean, we've uh, come up with this by watching our community use Upperpedia, especially students. Uh, and we see the needs that they have. Uh, sometimes they create a page, they create an operations manual, they create, the, and they subdivide the content in the way that makes sense for them because they have different audiences sometimes. Um, they make the page for, their you know for for submission but they also create for a client that they're working with so so 
by noticing this, we started thinking about how we can improve the structure and make it easier for them. So um, now we're trying to work by creating a structure first and then tackling the adding content, right? So, and making it simple, as, as simple as possible. Amazing. And Ira just wrote a very nice comment saying that he is so glad that the projects are downloadable because we're especially where in places where connection and internet is poor. Um, so this is the, we can open now the floor for questions from everyone. Anyone, please go ahead. Sandra has a question. Yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. That was super interesting and it's really great to see what Avropedia can do and uh, love to know also what Derek asked about uh, the moderation of the platform. <laughs> There's hopefully not as strict um, a relevance criteria there. <laughs> but what my question would be is, um, are there any projects that you recommend us using as a template or is there even already a template project that I could copy to start my own documentation, like to have a structure and to be guided a little bit more through the functionality because it looked so so easy how you did it now with creating the links, but if I'm not very experienced, uh, it will take me a little bit more time, of course, to learn this. Um, yeah, definitely. Um... We have a bunch of different templates uh, for projects, so we can um, tweak them. I, I think it's important to sit down just for a few minutes and think about what do I want my documentation to look like in, in the end, right? So it brings out the questions of who is going to read this and how are they going to use it? Um, so one of the things that we noticed was that in many cases, especially international development, documentation is meant for the donors and not for the communities, right? So it's always meant to be a PDF to be sent to, uh, yeah, to someone to say, oh yeah, this was a nice project. There's, uh, you know, that's a nice picture of a child, uh, but not necessarily for someone to take this and reproduce it. But sometimes you have different audiences. So it's good to, yeah, to sit down and think about it. So I can share some examples of good, projects. Um, we have some people who are doing, you know what, I have one that I really love. Um, I will, let's see, uh, which is the, so I'm going to share it here, but I will add it to the presentation and then uh, be available for other people to so I really like this project that I mentioned before uh, of the air filter, and I will share my screen again. I, I think it's such a brilliant project. Not only, be, I mean, there are other projects that already um, show you how to make an air filter from a fan, but I, I think the way that this was documented was really nice. Um, it has everything that you need for the documentation, like it has, what do you require? The tools, the knowledge, et cetera. And it has these assembly instructions. So let me uh, mute this. But yeah, you can go here uh, and see, you know, they're explaining how it's assembled. So it's something that you can really follow through and it uses not only text. So it, it's good enough documentation in text that you can put it on a PDF, print it, show it to someone else. But it also has good video material um, that you can follow through if you have access to the internet, right? So it has both. Uh, I think it's really good. And it has this here. Uh, it explains how to assemble it, um, how to operate it. Like it has everything. How to use it, safety instructions. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's so, uh, yeah, like, Put it in front of the outlet, uh, plug it in. You know, like it has every single step. I think it's one of the most brilliant documentation pages that I've seen. Um, gives you what to do, what not to do. Um, you know, instructions of maintenance, which is something that sometimes we just overlook. Like, yeah, this works, but for how long? When should you change the filter for this? Or, um, yeah, and and. 
uh, related to safety. And then you can see here that it has an update. Um, and this is this is really cool. So this is one of the things that uh, Appropriate is good at, uh, for, that people can come in years later and say, oh, you know, someone's going to use this for a different project, right? And then they say, there's a derivative and you can, um, yeah, go and check it out. And here it is, right? So this is the other project that I was mentioning. And I think the documentation is quite good as well. And that they have a lot of research on how, yeah, how it was uh, made and the changes that were made to design, et cetera, right? So you can really follow through from start to finish, go into the mind of the person making the thing. Um, so yeah, that's my favorite documentation page that you can just take some ideas from. But I can show you also some templates uh, later on for you to uh, use if you're interested in documenting specific projects. Thank you so much. Eric, you have a very uh, interesting question. So maybe if you can unmute yourself and ask it yourself and also just if it's possible to give a very brief uh, introduction about Wacoma because I think it would be super interesting and might be even uh, interconnected to Apropita. Sure, thanks, Maria. I'm sorry, my, I have my kid here who might be crying any second, but um, we're really interested in connectivity and enabling people to connect themselves to the internet in ways that they find relevant and meaningful. Cheesy elevator pitch, but that's, that's the bottom line of what we're working on. Um, we've come across several projects like Internet in a Box, Rachel, QX has their own offline solution. Um, there's a whole bunch of different groups and projects that are working on bringing parts of the internet offline, um, and some of which are part of this offline internet consortium, it's called. My question is, I, I know that some of these platforms already do have Appropedia in its entirety available offline, and I don't, I don't know how big it is, to be honest. It's probably a couple of gigs. Um, maybe the speaker could uh, elaborate on that. Um, but some platforms, including Wikipedia, Internet Archive, are starting to put their content on the distributed web. Inter interplanetary file system, super cheesy name, but um, pretty awesome project of, of being able to distribute content and, and enable peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer file sharing and transfer and so on. So I'm just wondering uh, if that's something that's being worked on or um, are there other ways of getting this important content to the three plus billion people who are not currently connected to the internet in a meaningful way? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so the first one is, I have never heard of the distributed web um, and I would be super interested in hearing more about it. Uh, if you have the time, we can chat. Um, but regarding um, offline connectivity, so we, we have two competing um, options for now, which are, yeah, using Kiwix and then the printed version. And we're like, right now, our hypothesis is that printed is easier and it's faster. Um, with Kiwix, we've uh, we've been in communications with them for a while. Um, there were some errors on their, I don't know, the, the, their, their, uh, when creating the SIM file, we found some errors. Um, so for now, uh, we decided to stop that for a little bit. We, we, we only have a couple of hands to work on the technical aspect of Appropedia. Um, and we're actually looking to, yeah, find ways of doing it. So one, one, uh, application of this is the surgical training materials that we're, um, working to develop with other people. Uh, especially to bring into areas of Africa. Uh, there's a bunch of people who are uh, trying to use it at hospitals for doctors to uh, review the materials and then do quizzes, do their self-evaluations, uh, and at the end, record themselves doing a simulation and uploading it so that they can uh, receive a, a certification or at least saying yes, you've uh, gone through this training. So, so we are interested in uh, using Qix. Uh, yeah, we, we still have some kinks to, to sort out. So I would be super interested in hearing more about your work and how can, uh, yeah, move towards that direction. 
But yeah, the other side is the printed uh, version because I think it's super uh, important to have materials that are tangible, especially, um, yeah, because it's, it's uh, more accessible for some people and uh, easier for it to last for longer, et cetera. Lovely. We're almost coming to an end of our call, but I feel so tempted to still open it for a little bit for anyone who's, who have any questions. I see Yuri is also here. Yeah, Yuri, you were able to join for the second half of the call. I'm wondering if you might have any questions, comments from what you've um, seen from the presentation, but also anyone else. I'm just like making some suggestions here. Taking the look at Okay, so if there is no more comments or questions, so I think we, with this we can go ahead and um, uh, come to an end of our call and. First of all, we'd like to thank you so much, um, Emilio, uh, for taking the time for this wonderful presentation. One of the things that I'm really happy about is that it's recorded and will be available uh, for the rest of the members to take a look at, because I know already there are some who weren't able to make it and really wanted to attend. So um, yeah, hallelujah that we can still use the power of recording also for this. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, just a general remark, um, we'll have our next community call next Wednesday uh, at 2 uh, p.m. CET, and that's gonna be the continuation of the business models discussion. Also a super uh, interesting discussion uh, where it tackles all kinds of sustainability models for makerspaces specifically, but also in general, and it's going to have to happen next week. So stay stay tuned. We have also surprise speakers, uh, some of which are outside of the community, like not a gig member. And um, yeah, looking forward to see you, uh, more of you uh, during these calls. And yeah, with this, I open the floor. Thank you, Emilio. Thanks, everyone, and see Thanks. you very soon. <laughs>